change based on various things such as the rake structure, the anti-structure, your opponent's tendencies, your position. We're going to go through a lot of GTO examples and we're going to discuss how to adjust from the GTO charts to whatever situation you are in. If you have not already gotten your free preflop charts, make sure you check out pokercoaching.com slash charts. They're completely free for you. If you are a Poker Coaching member, make sure you get the Poker Coaching app on your phone. Go in there, get the GTO preflop charts. As you can see, it's going to be very similar to what we are looking at here today. Right there on your phone, ready for you. You can follow along at home. You can also follow along on your computer on pokercoaching.com if you're logged in. You can go to the tools section. I'll show you right here. Click on the tools section, go to GTO preflop tournament charts or GTO preflop cash game charts for whatever you're playing and you'll have the charts there for you. Um, if you are not a poker coaching member, you'll have access to some of the charts, but poker coaching members get access to all the charts. Y'all may not know this, but some sites out there charge over $500 a month for access to fewer charts than these. So this is a heck of a value. It's there for you. It's just included with a poker coaching premium membership if you're enjoying the show. Click the like button. Click the subscribe button. I know we just got started. You probably aren't liking any of this yet. You won your first final table. Fourth place. Or fourth. Wait. You won your first final table. Sean won something. Good job. Good work. Yesterday, poker coaching coach Justin Saliba took fifth place in a $15,000 buy-in tournament. Then he bubbled the 25 k It's actually a running joke. Whenever he makes the final table of a tournament at the Poker Go studio, he immediately loses every all-in. I was watching him yesterday on Poker Go, and he immediately got it all-in with a coin flip. I think he had 10s against ace queen, lost. Then he got it in with uh, <laughs> jacks against 10s against aces. He had the big stack, though, I think, against the 10s, and the aces was, was short. But the 10s won all the money. And then he lost some other all in. He got three outer. He had ace queen to ace jack. Sounds about right. Fifth place for him. Such is life. Do you really need GTO charts for micro stakes? You at least need to know where to start and where to adjust to. Checks. This is the problem a lot of people make. They think. Ah, my opponents are bad. I can do whatever I want. I can play the 10-6 suited if I want. Or I can play the ace-9 off suit if I want. But um, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. It's important to realize that in order to succeed at poker, at least in my opinion, assuming you want to give yourself a good chance of success, you need to know how to play reasonably well. Assuming your opponents also play reasonably well. That way you know where to adjust from to take advantage of whatever they do wrong. And where to adjust to, to take advantage of, um, well, you, you want to adjust to what they're doing incorrectly. But also, if you don't know what they're doing incorrectly, you need to know how to adjust back to a reasonable preflop strategy. Also, as Louis Philippe here, who runs the poker coaching study sessions, he says, range construction is key to good post-flop play. Yeah, if you have too many premium hands and not enough garbage, not enough junk, in your range, you end up with way too strong of post-flop ranges. Or... If you play too much junk pre-flop, you end up with way too much garbage after the flop, which is a big problem. You want to make sure you're playing good, fundamentally sound ranges. Okay? So, first things I want to show you. Whenever you're playing in a game with a rake and no ante, which is going to be most cash games that you play, I realize some cash games have an ante, some cash games don't take a rake because you pay to go into the... Uh, perhaps a legal gambling operation ahead of time. Maybe you pay time rank, it's or time rake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If they don't take a rake out of the pot, you can play slightly looser because each pot will be a little bit bigger, right? As there's more money in the pot, you need to fight a little bit harder for it. For example, if uh, the pot's 100 big blinds pre-flop because they put 100 big blinds in the pot for a, a bomb pot for whatever reason, or because of some weird bonus. Because your hand got your table got lucky and they put 100 big blinds in the pot. You should be playing really, really, really wide, right? But if there's no money in the pot, imagine there's zero dollars in the pot. Well, you should be playing really, 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 really tight. Okay. So most cash games feature a rake and no ante. Okay. Whereas tournaments basically always feature no rake and an ante. Which means when you're playing tournaments, the pots are going to be bigger before the flop. Just a little bit bigger, but just a little bit bigger is going to be enough to make you adjust your strategy. All right, what we're looking at here is a 100 big blind cash game chart. This is like if you go play 1-3 no limit, you buy in for 300 bucks. Here we are. 
We're under the gun. This is your RFI strategy. RFI means raise first in. That means if it folds to you, which obviously it does under the gun, your first act, this is what you should do. You should raise with the hands in red, fold the hands in blue. And you will probably be surprised as to how incredibly tight this is. This presumes a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight handed table. If you're under the gun at a nine handed table or a 10 handed table, you should be even tighter. You may say, why in the world would you want to play so tightly? Well, because there's a rake and there's no ante. This is the exact opposite of what most people do. Most people play all sorts of garbage. You give them the 4-3 uh, suited, they play it. You give them the pocket fours, they play it. You give them the ace 10, they play it. It's a big, big, big mistake to play very loose, especially from out of position with junky offsuit hands. And I realize like ace jack offsuit isn't even junky, right? That said, I do think you should play wider than these charts recommend, specifically when your opponents do not re-raise you enough. If your opponents do not re-raise you enough, you in turn get to play wider ranges, okay? And most people in most live cash games especially do not re-raise nearly often enough. Um, let's just take a look real quick at how under the gun plus one should play. By the way, I'm clicking these little buttons up here. You'll have these little buttons on your poker coaching charts that you will need to learn to get proficient at. Under the gun plus one versus a raise from under the gun. Take a look at this. This is the strategy from a game theory optimal point of view, which again is not what you're necessarily going to be playing. When you are in second position when under the gun raises. Notice, no calling. You never call. You three bet or you fold. Now, I fully realize almost no one does this, right? Most people play poorly. I know a lot of people think, oh, I don't do this because of this and this and this, which may be true. But are you aware that this is roughly the GTO strategy? Certainly, you could perhaps develop a slightly different strategy that does involve some calling. But it turns out, if your opponent's playing the GTO strategy under the gun, you in turn do not call much at all. You do a lot of three betting when you are in most of the early positions. That's because if you call, somebody attack and three bet you, which is a disaster. Take, let's take a look at the low jack seat. Low jack seat is under the gun six hand, uh, six handed. So we're starting to get a little bit later. As we get a little bit later, you'll start to see more calls. But even then, notice, hands like pocket sevens does not call every time. Queen jack suited folds every time. Ace queen offsuit folds every time, right? So you see there's almost no, well, still a relatively tight range, right? Got to have a brain fuel so we can think right and put a sentence together. It's early in the morning for me. But you do still see some three betting, but calling with the hands that flop very, very well. Notice hands like ace, queen, ace, jack, king, queen are not playable. Why? Because you're very likely to be dominated by the under the gun range. As we move over to the hijack seat, we're going to play slightly wider. Cut off seat, we're going to play slightly wider. Button. Now, now let's think about this. What do you actually do on the button when under the gun raises and it folds to you on the button? Do you ever fold the king-queen offsuit, the ace-jack offsuit, the queen-nine suited, the jack-nine suited, the nine-seven suited, the pocket fours, etc.? Most people don't. They call every time. Most people call the ten-six suited and the ten-seven suited and the jack-eight suited and the queen-ten offsuit and the ace-nine offsuit, and that's why they lose. It turns out if you play poorly, if you blunder left and right all the time, you're going to lose. Who'd have thought, Right? If you start off playing really poorly preflop, it's not going to work out for you. All right, now let's go up here. Let's take a look at what happens if a player like the hijack raises instead. Now, we're going to be three betting. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Let's take a look if we're on the button versus a hijack raise. There we go. Clicking the wrong buttons over here. Now we're going to be looser, but with lots more three betting as well, right? So we see more three betting, mainly from the suited ace X type hands right? But we still get to call with all the hands that flop well. In position, you do a decent amount of calling with hands that flop well, and a decent amount of three betting with hands that have good blockers. As you see, the ace-x suited blocks your opponent from having aces, ace-king, ace-queen, etc. And the king-x suited blocks him from having kings and ace-king, right? Same thing here. The ace-king, well, ace-king's a good hand, but ace-queen, ace-jack, and king-queen are used as blockers. Is this live? It's probably delayed about two seconds, so not quite live. Um, as you see, when the hijack raises, the hijack raises, right? By the way, positions are button, cutoff, hijack. Big blind, small blind, button, cutoff, hijack. 
Notice, you don't 3-bet the jacks and the 10s and the 9s and the 8s and the 7s. This is something else a lot of people do wrong. They get a hand like pocket jacks, and they 3-bet it every time. They think, oh, jacks, I want to re-raise. I want to re-raise the jacks. No, 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 no. Not if your opponent's range should be relatively tight. Okay? That's very important to know. This is just like ABC fundamental poker. Okay? When we're playing deep stacked with no rake, with no... Or with a rake and with no ante. With a rake, with no ante. Which is what most people play when they're playing cash games. Most people who play cash games screw up left and right. Now, if your opponents are going to be raising too wide, and they're not going to 4-bet you enough, then you in turn get to play wider, right? The thing that people can do before the flop that really screws you up is re-raising. If your opponents don't re-raise, you in turn, in turn get to play wider. Okay? Now let's take a look at um, small blind strategy. You're going to find the small blind GTO strategy in a cash game with a rake, with no ante, three bets, basically everything that you're going to play. Which again, is what most people do not do. Okay? As we see, small blind strategy versus a hijack raise, three bets, every hand they're going to play. No calling. Why? Because you're going to have worst relative position, meaning on the flop, small blind checks, big blind checks, whoever raised preflop is going to bet. Small blind has to act before the big blind. So the small blind is really in a bad spot after the flop if you call preflop and the big blind calls as well, which they often will. So you don't want to be in that spot. So you want to three bet every hand you play to get the big blind out. When you do three bet, by the way, you're going to be three betting pretty big. If somebody raises to three big blinds, you're going to make it something like 12 big blinds from the small blind. Like pretty big. Most people screw up and they re-raise to eight. And then they get called every time. And they wonder, what did I do wrong? How did they keep out flopping me? Well, you're giving your opponent really, 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 really good odds. Okay? So, from the small blind, you're going to be 3-betting versus basically every position in every spot. Let me go through here and just take a look to confirm this. For all of you, you can do this on your app at home. Uh, small blind. Clicking the wrong buttons up here. Small blind versus raise from under the gun. Do you see 3-bet or fold everything? Notice how tight you are. You're supposed to even fold hands like 9s and 8s and 7s and 6s. Again, most people don't do this, but I think it's actually okay to have a calling range if the player in the big blind doesn't three bet enough and plays poorly preflop, right? So always ask, what did the opponents do wrong? Does the big blind going to three bet enough? Answer is almost always no. That lets you play wider than the GTO charts recommend. Here we are against low jack, as you see, three betting or folding against cutoff, three betting or folding against button, three betting or folding. No flat calls from the small blind. This will make all of you a whole lot more money if you just start doing this. 3-bet a good, strong, linear range from the small blind when somebody raises in front of you in a cash game with a rake and no ante. Okay? What about from the big blind? From the big blind, you're going to have some calls. But you're probably going to be tighter than I think a lot of people imagine. Okay? So this is big blind versus a raise from the button. This is as wide as you can possibly play from the big blind. This is it. This is as wide as you can play. As your opponent is in earlier position, you in turn must play fewer hands because their range is going to be stronger. Under the gun, I'm sorry, I keep clicking the wrong button because I'm a fish. Big blind <laughs> versus a raise from under the gun. You see here, this is very tight. You fold a ton. Why are you folding a ton against an under the gun raise? Because their range has to be really good. If it's not, they're just going to get demolished because they're raising a bunch of garbage into a lot of people. Okay? Okay. As you see, low jack seat here. Roughly same thing when the low jack raises. Big blind versus cutoff. Roughly same thing. As you see, we're three betting a good, strong, linear high cards, plus a few suited connectors, plus a few blockers, right? Suited blockers. The one spot it starts to get a little bit different is when the, uh, the button raises. Now you start to three bet a lot of these uh, middle suited connected type hands, which is kind of neat, plus some weaker blockers. But as you see, you're not calling with stuff like ace two offsuit. You're not calling stuff like 9-8 offsuit or 8-7 offsuit. Now, you can play a little bit wider than this if, if your opponents play poorly post-flop. If they're going to check it down whenever they miss after the flop, you can play a lot wider. If they're going to mindlessly blast off on the flop to turn in the river every time, you can play wider, right? If you know what your opponent's doing correctly, you should adjust to take advantage of them. 
Okay. Let's see. Let's see. I saw a question I wanted to address. Under the gun plus one versus under the gun raise. Okay, let's see. Under the gun plus one versus raise from under the gun. Ace in suited three bets, but ace jack suited folds. What is the reason for this? So look, you'll find that GTO sporadically does kind of weird stuff. Like this. This is kind of weird. And it has to do with card removal and blockers against a specific range that you're against. I would not read too much into it. For simplicity's sake, if you wanted to make an implementable strategy here, you probably just 3-bet ace-jack suited. 3-bet king-6 suited and king-5 suited. Forget about king-7. Forget about ace-7 suited. Forget about ace-8 suited. And just 3-bet ace-5 and ace-4 suited. And 3-bet ace-7 suited and forget about these two. That way you don't have to worry about balancing at all. And don't have to worry about randomization at all. You're not going to be playing perfect GTO, but that is usually a very, very nice thing to do. Okay? Bishmar says, oh my gosh, I was using tournament preflop charts and cash games. Well, it's important to know what game you're playing. Step number one, when you're playing a game, is to know the rules of the game. You think it would be clever to give all the preflop charts to people. Well, Barbie, we already did that for uh, a large chunk of the charts. Go to pokercoaching.com slash charts. They're there for you. If you want access to all the charts, there are a lot of them. Go to pokercoaching.com slash valentines. Valentine? Valentines? I think it has an S at the end. Let me edit this. I think slash valentines. Because we're having a sale for Valentine's Day. Enjoy it. Check it out. Pokercoaching.com slash valentines. All right. So, now you know. You got to be pretty tight in cash games. When early position raises, you're also in early position. You mostly three better fold. And when you do call, you're calling with... Hands that flop very well. Primarily, good suited big cards, good pairs, and suited connectors. Good suited connectors, right? The, here we have hijack versus under the gun raise, right? Notice the offsuit hands are particularly bad. These hands are particularly bad. And now, you may say, doesn't this um, make me play really tight? Yeah. When you're against a strong range and you're out of position, you got to play really tight. Who'd have thought? To be fair, against a tight range on the button, you still got to be really tight because you're against a tight range. Against a tight range, with a rake in play, you just can't get too out of line. You have to play good cards. And if you don't, you're going to lose money. People wonder why they lose at small stakes games. I'll tell you what most people do horribly, horribly wrong. You want to know what they do? They model their strategy after their opponents. They think that they should do what their opponents do. They see everybody going limp, 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 limp. And they think, oh, I'm going to limp in too because everybody else is limping. Or they see somebody raise to 10 big blinds preflop and then somebody else raises to 10 big blinds preflop. They think, oh, that's the standard raise. I'm going to raise to 10 big blinds preflop too. Turns out if you play poorly, like your opponents who cannot beat small stakes games, you will lose. Who'd have thought? If you play poorly, you will lose. How many small stakes players are playing GTO? Almost none. And that's a very good reason why most of them lose. Won't playing this tight get you no action with your value hands? Um, maybe, but think about what happens if you get no action with your value hands. Take a second to think about it. Oh, my, one of my kids' schools is calling me. Should probably answer this. Hello? Yes. One of my kids has a cough and has to go get picked up from school. Just one second. Just one second. Grandpa's watching the kids today. Hopefully we can get a hold of him. Probably not going to answer. <laughs> Give me one minute, everybody. Real life stuff. Turns out, whenever your child has a cough at school, they send them home nowadays.
All right, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back. Um, okay. Louis Fleet says, so this chart's a little bit tight, but you need to consider that you pay the rake when you play cash games. Yeah, most people don't. They forget about the rake. Um, what was the other question? Oh, if you play tightly, will your opponents not pay you off when you have the nuts? Maybe not. Maybe they start folding a lot to you. What happens if your opponents start folding a lot to you? Well, it turns out all your bluffs get through. Take a look at this range here. Button versus under the gun. Does this range look like only the nuts when you three bet? When under the gun raises and you three bet the ace three suited or the ace four suited or the king five suited or the ace seven suited or the six five suited and then they fold, is that bad? No, it's good. It's good. Also, it's important to be balanced, right? It's very important to be balanced. All right, fine. Oh, here we go. Grandpa's texting back. Grandpa says, he didn't cough with me. What do you want from me, Grandpa? What do you want from me, Grandpa? Um, okay. Let's take a look at tournament charts now. So far, I've been looking at specifically 100 big blind cash game charts. Uh, by the way, I guess we should look at uh, deeper stacked play as well. Let's take a look at deeper stack play. We have charts not just for 100 big blinds. Let's look at 200 big blind charts. Take a look at this chart. Snapshot it in your mind. Screenshot it. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Right click, print it out, put it on your wall. Let's take a look at 200 big blind charts. What's going to change? Mm, probably not a ton actually in this exact spot. Button versus under the gun range. 4.5% uh, 3, 3 bets, 7.7% 7 .7 call. Roughly same strategy. So it actually does not, not much changes 200 big blinds compared to 100 big blinds. Let's take a look though at button versus raise from cutoff. We'll start to see some differences here. Notice your 9% three bet, 10% calls, 100 big blinds deep. 200 big blinds deep, we start to play a little bit more aggressively, right? Just a little bit, just a little bit, right? And why are we playing just a little bit more aggressively, 200 big blinds deep in position compared to 100 big blinds deep? Well, it's because position matters more, okay? To give you an extreme, uh, an extreme example of this, a bit more of an extreme example, Let's take a look at big blind versus raise from button. 100 big blinds deep. As we see here, three betting 14, calling 26, folding 59. 14, 26, 59. Let's take a look at 200 big blinds deep. Eleven, thirty-three, fifty-five. 55, right? Is that right? Mm. Eh, I don't know. Something like this. What what I mainly want to show is that you probably aren't going to do quite as much three betting uh, 200 big blinds deep, right? So take a look at the main difference here. Big difference is that you three bet less 200 big blinds deep out of position, right? And that's because when you're out of position, your opponent's going to call a lot. You can go to the flop and you're still going to be deep stacked, which is really, 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 really bad, right? So if you go through and you... Take a look at the charts and you spend some time going through them and looking at differences in them. You can start extrapolating as to what changes as you get deeper stacked, as you get shallower stacked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? What about charts when facing limpers? Do you still use the RFI charts? No, no, no. This chart very specifically says what it's for. Very specifically, RFI means raise first in. If somebody limps in front of you, you're no longer first in. Somebody's already first in. So now you have to ask, are there GTO charts for when let people limp in, in front of you? Are there GTO charts for when people limp in front of you? Assuming not when small blind limps. And the answer is no. Why? Because when people limp, they're not playing the GTO strategy. They are already playing so poorly when they open limp in, especially when there's a rake in play, that there is no GTO preflop charts, right? Because that they're not playing anywhere near the GTO strategy. So now the question becomes, what does my opponent do wrong? How are they screwing up? So you have to ask, if they're limping and they're going to limp fold a lot, obviously you raise with a ton of hands because they're going to fold a ton and you just win free money. If they're going to call you every time or re-raise you every time, you have to start playing much better hands, right? Louis Philippe says, Matt Affleck typically raises a little bit tighter so he removes like 10 to 15% of hands whenever he's against a limper. And I think that's probably about right. Because most people, when they limp, they're not planning to limp and then fold. 
Now, some people do, some people do not, right? I will say that against early position limpers, I'm usually pretty cautious because early position limpers will often trap with hands like um, aces, right? Whereas if somebody in the hijack seat or the cutoff seat or the button limps, they're usually playing a lot of garbage because they usually raise their best hands. So their range would look, um, well, something like these hands all in green, right? Because they'd raise the hands in red. So their range starts to look something like this in green, which makes it all non-premium, right? So if cutoff limps with all these hands in green or maybe even wider, you can raise quite wide because if they call with a bunch of non-premium hands, it's not that big of a deal and they're out of position. That's great, right? So you always have to ask, what did the opponents do wrong? But it's not as easy as take a look at a chart and do what that says for a, a situation that it's not for, right? It's very, very important to make sure that you use the charts for specifically what they are for, okay? All right, so now I've looked at all this uh, cash game scenario. Um, let's let's take a snapshot of something in our mind. 100 big blinds deep versus array, big blind versus array is from the button. You fold roughly 60% of the time, okay? From a GTO point of view. Now let's take a look at a tournament chart. We have 80 big blind tournament charts, big blind versus raise from button. You see now we fold 16% of the time. Almost never. Almost never. So why is GTO folding 60% of the time in a cash game, but 16% of the time in a tournament? Funny enough, notice three betting strategy is actually um, pretty similar. Kind of cool to see, right? You just do a whole lot more calling. The reason you call substantially wider is because there's an ante in play and because there's no rake in play. Also, I believe these charts presume a slightly smaller preflop raise size in tournaments. I think this is 2.5 big blind raise. Maybe it's 2.25, something like that, compared to three big blinds. Um, but anyway, as you're getting better odds, as the pot is bigger, et cetera, et cetera, you must play wider ranges. A lot of people are surprised to see queen two offsuit you can call. Now, I will say, I will say that I don't actually mind folding out some of these really junky offsuit hands. If you told me you wanted to fold out the 10, five and the jack four and the queen three and the queen two and the jack three, fine. If you're folding out stuff like queen seven though, that is way, 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 way too tight. And a lot of people do play way, 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 way too tight. A lot of people um, wonder why tournament players do so poorly at cash games. Well, because they play ranges like this when they should be playing ranges like this in the different game. It's important to realize tournaments and cash games are different games. Seems like common sense to me, but for some people it's not common sense. They think we're playing no limit hold'em. I learned a long time ago that there were various forms of no limit hold'em because I used to play a ton of sit and goes. And I tried to play sit and go strategy and multi table tournament strategy. And who'd have thought I lost my shirt? Not shocking, right? If you use strategies for a game that they are not designed for, you will probably lose. Okay? To what extent does GTO account for value on future streets? GTO presumes everyone plays perfectly on all betting rounds, pre-flop and post-flop. All right, let's go through these tournament charts real quick. All right, let's take a look at this first scenario. It's gonna come up very often. You need to roughly know what to do in these spots. 80 big blinds deep, big blind versus a button raise. So button raises, we're in the big blind, what do we do? Notice, three bet all the good hands, three bet some ASAC suited, three bet some junky blockers, and three bet these suited hands in the middle, suited connected hands in the middle. Most people don't three bet these hands right in here. And most people don't three bet these hands right in here. So what does that do to their range? Well, it makes their range a whole lot stronger, right? Which means in turn, we should now overfold. Let's go over here and look at button versus a three bet from the big blind. Notice, button actually calls a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So now, introducing a new color here, we're four betting the hands in red, calling the hands in green, folding the hands in blue, right? And obviously we folded the hands in gray preflop, we didn't raise those to begin with. So 
We're four betting the best hands plus a few blockers. You're going to find that in general, when you are in position, you four bet very polarized. Okay? Meaning you're four betting either the nuts or nothing. The hands that are the nuts, you're obviously getting it all in. These hands here. Everything else is a bluff. And notice all the bluffs, for the most part, are blockers. Notice here, we are calling a ton. A lot, right? Queen 10 offsuit, King 10 offsuit, Queen Jack offsuit, Jack 10 offsuit. These are not great hands, but you have to call in this scenario. Notice that the really bad offsuit hands, though, Ace 8, King 9, 9, 7, etc., all these fold. Lots of the suited hands call as well. This is something a lot of people don't do. They overfold. But I actually don't think overfolding here is that bad against people who three bet too tightly. And remember, I just told you, most people in the big blind don't three bet the suited connectors and the junky blockers. They just don't do it. They call every time. So if that's the case, we should start shaving off some of these hands at the bottom of the range on the suited side and also the offsuit side. So jack 10, queen 10, king 10, ace 9, fold them. Fold. I have no problem with that right? And you see, this is how you have to learn to think for yourself and not just blindly follow even the GTO chart. Now, certainly you can go through and develop a chart based on what you think your opponents are going to do wrong, but if you're sitting there playing poker and let's say the big blind three bets a lot, let's say they three bet a ton, well now you have to defend even wider, right? So it's not as easy as making a chart adjusted to what everybody does wrong because everybody doesn't do the same thing wrong. And this is why, as someone asked at the start of the show, why do we even care about these GTO charts? because we need to know where to start, right? If we're starting here and we wanna play a little bit tighter, it's easy to just shave off the bottom portion of this range, right? These hands right in here, these hands right in here, and then you're probably gonna be good to go. Maybe you'll still be a little too loose, maybe you'll be a little bit too tight, you know, you're gonna be, you're gonna be close, right? And as long as you're close, then you're gonna be fine. But what most people do is they think, okay, I need to play tighter, you know what they do? They just continue with only the best hands. Like they, they literally fold everything besides the top like five or 10% of hands. And now they're making a blunder, right? Also, what if the opponent does re uh, three bet a ton? Well, we in turn need to four bet a lot and call a lot, right? So now we need to defend even wider. It's kind of, but you may look at this chart and think, oh my God, I got to defend even wider? Well, probably going to include more four bet bluffs. Unless, of course, they're just going to five bet rip it in on you. If they're going to include more four bet bluffs, you should also include more value hands like eights and ace jack suited become value hands to get it in but you have to learn to think for yourself right and i, I want to make it clear this is not even a necessarily high level poker strategy this is what all good players do all the time they know roughly what the gto strategy looks like they may not know that jack 10 offsuit four bets 24 percent of the time and queen 10 offsuit four bets eight percent of the time but they know you're supposed to mix in some some junky blocker bluffs some suited suited uh king x blocker bluffs like they, they know this kind of thing and then, based on what the opponent does incorrectly, usually th three betting too tightly, they'll adjust accordingly. Okay? And if you presume everybody does the same thing wrong, you're probably going to leave a lot of money on the table. At the end of the day, the way you make the most money from playing poker is by adjusting to what your opponent's doing correctly. But in order to adjust to something, you must know where you're adjusting from. Okay? Greetings from Greece. Hello, hello. He's going through depression. I hate to hear that. Depression is a rough thing. My morning sessions helped you. Well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I'm certainly not a therapist. Do not uh, treat me like one. I do my best. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. If you're enjoying the show, do me a favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons below. Click the notification bell. The YouTube overlords appreciate it. All right. Remember, remember, when we looked at cash game charts earlier, the small blind three bet literally every time. You think that's going to happen when we are playing in a tournament? Take a second, think about it. This is not the correct chart. Is a small blind going to have a calling range against an under the gun raise? Yes, it will. Why? Because we're facing a smaller preflop raise and because there's no rake and no ante, right? So notice, again, small blind strategy in a cash game with a rake and no ante is drastically different than in a tournament. Okay? It's important to understand the game you're playing and the structural differences of the game. Okay? So notice, all the hands that 3-bet, just your strong best hands, plus a few bluffs that have good post-slot playability. You will notice that small blind 3-betting range and big blind 3-betting range both include a lot of hands with good playability. 
okay? And that's because whenever you are out of position, you will naturally get called a lot by the raiser in position, which means that you must have a hand that plays well, okay? So let's take a look at small blind versus low jack raise. This is middle position. You see still pretty tight, but, you know, the calling range is going to be roughly the same hands. Three betting range is roughly the same hands. Cut off, roughly same story, just a little bit wider, right? Notice again, most people miss all of these three bets in here. Most people don't three bet this type of, these type of hands ever. Small blind versus button. This is where we're going to start to get a little bit wider even. Lots of three betting, but still some calls. Now, take a look at this chart. This is kind of similar to the spot where I recommended folding your weakest hands in the big blind against a raise because you're going to under-realize your equity. Okay? Now, in this spot, from the small blind, I think you're also probably going to under-realize your equity if you're being honest with yourself and realistic. So I would fold out these hands right in here. Really, from out of position, I think you should just play a little bit tighter because most people cannot play perfect GTO poker out of position. It's hard. It's hard to mix in all the correct check raises, et cetera, et cetera. So... I would fold out some of these hands at the bottom here. I fold out some of these hands at the bottom here. Really, any of these hands that are folded a, a decent chunk of the time, I would just fold them, right? Like 10-9, just fold. Ace-7, just fold. Ace-5, just fold. Jack-7, suited, fold. Queen-5, suited. King-2, suited, fold. Fold, 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 fold. I'm fine and good with that. I, I have no issue with that. When you're playing in a tournament without antes, do we follow the cash game charts? No. It's somewhere in the middle. Because you have to realize the rake is usually way, way bigger than the ante. Well, it's, it's at least equally meaningful as the ante. So it's almost like you're playing a hybrid of these two charts. If you overlay them on top of each other, your strategy is going to be somewhere in the middle. Okay? Okay, so this is a small blind strategy. Uh, again, notice, in the cash games, remember, remember back to the cash game charts. Let me, I'll, I'll pull it up for you. Small blind versus raise from button. Here's your small blind strategy in a cash game against a button range. 100 big blinds deep. Here's your small blind strategy getting but against a button raise in a tournament. So you see, in a tournament, you're playing roughly seven, uh, 30, 31% of hands. In a cash game, you're playing roughly 14% of hands. Half as many hands. Lionel says you're getting ready for the World Series of Poker Circuit event. Good luck. Have fun. So in a cash game, you see you're playing substantially tighter from out of position, again, because of the rake and the ante, etc. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let's see, what should we talk about now? Let's go look at under the gun, open raising range, and let's just click through here a little bit to see the hands we should generally be playing. Notice under the gun in a tournament, eight-handed, you're still going to be pretty tight. Not super nitty, not super nitty, but pretty tight, okay? Uh, you may be surprised to see hands like king eight suited, raised from every position. King eight suited's a pretty good hand. Now, one thing I will say is that in general, most people don't three bet enough. So if people don't three bet enough, what should you do? What should your adjustment be? Take a second, think about it. If your opponents don't three bet enough, what should you do to this chart naturally? When should you register into a tournament? Whenever you feel like it. As you register later, your edge will be smaller. Both positive edge and negative edge will be smaller as you register later. Yeah, congrats to Justin, Silva, uh, Justin Saliba, poker coaching coach. Made the final table of the $15,000 tournament yesterday, then promptly lost three all-ends. He has fared very poorly at Poker Go final tables. So have I, to be fair. Poker Go Studio has not been great to us. It's like you get it all in and you lose. It's brutal. A lot of you are getting it. You raise much wider. That's exactly correct. If your opponents are not going to three bet you, you should raise wider because you're not going to get punished for raising wider. So what do I do? Eight handed under the gun. What does my raising range look like normally? All these hands in red, of course. Ace two suited, king seven suited, 10 eight suited, nine eight suited, eight seven, seven six, six five suited, all these. Fours, threes, twos, eh. I'm not going to say I always raise threes and twos or fours, but I often do. King Jack for sure. Queen Jack, probably not. King 10, probably not. This is, one, again, one of these like weird blocker hands. I don't think it's necessary to raise. But King Jack, sure. And that's usually what I'm raising. I'm raising a little bit wider. Just a little bit wider. Let's move over to the hijack seat. As you see here, 
decently wide preflop raising range in the hijack seat ask yourself honestly when you're in the hijack seat remember this positions go big blind small blind button cut off hijack you can see it right here big blind small blind button cut off hijacks this is you know roughly middle position second act at a six-handed table um are you raising all of these hands now i will say that most people don't raise the ace eight offsuit which could be fine could be bad when do you not want to raise the bottom portion of this range you do not want to raise the bottom portion of this range when you expect to get three bet. But we just kind of said people don't three bet often enough. So if anything, you can probably raise a little bit wider than this. And it's A-OK. -okay. Now, obviously in a tournament compared to a cash game, there are going to be various stack depth implications and payout implications. Okay? How do you account for those when looking at a chart? I will generally say early in a tournament, payout implications are pretty close to irrelevant and stack depth concerns are pretty close to irrelevant early in a tournament plays very much like a cash game as you start getting to let's say 15 percent of the field gets paid and um i don't know maybe 25 percent of the field remains you know we're not that close to the money you still have to lose 40 percent of the field but we're starting to get pretty close uh that's when you are going to want to tighten up a little bit when you're a solid medium stack and loosen up a bit when you are a solid big stack um you may decide that you want to three bet a lot against your opponents if you're the big stack. You may decide that you want to raise a lot if you're the medium stack into the short stacks. So the stack distribution is going to start to matter. We discuss payout implications a ton in my tournament masterclass. So make sure you take advantage of that at pokercoaching.com slash valentines right now to get a big discount. You feel like you're playing tighter and folding ace-8, which is more exploitative. Well, Thomas, you're exploiting... Again, so look, whenever you do something different than the GTO charts, whenever you do anything different than the GTO charts, you are saying, I am doing this because of blank. Insert it. Why would you fold the ace-8? You're going to fold the ace-8 because you expect to get 3-bet a ton. Or maybe even call it a ton. You don't really want to have the ace-8 offsuit out of position if you expect the button to call a lot. Okay? So, is that true? Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I don't know. So, in general, I would say you should raise roughly this, perhaps widen it even a little bit more with more King X suited, maybe even a few more suited connectors, maybe stuff like King 9 offsuit, maybe stuff like 10 9 offsuit. I think that's fine. Okay? Why are the tournament charts looser than the cash game charts? We discussed this already. You must be late. Should it be not be the opposite? Oh, it definitely shouldn't be the opposite. You play wider in tournaments because there is no rake on any individual hand. You pay the rake when you buy in one time. You don't pay it on each hand. And there's an ante in play, so the pot is bigger. When the pot's bigger, you play wider. Okay? You should play tighter when there's ICM pressure. Not necessarily. Up and down can. You should not necessarily play tighter when there's ICM pressure. Because if you're a big stack, you get to play wider. You get to apply pressure to the other people. If you are a medium stack and there's all short stacks yet to act and they're all guaranteed to get in the money, if they just sit there and play tight, well, you should be super aggressive, even with a medium stack, right? I'll give you an example. Say we're on the stone bubble of a tournament and you have 15 big blinds, okay? Small blind and big blind both have 12. Everybody else has 100 except for three players on the stone bubble who all have one big blind. So three people have one big blind. Small blind and big blind have 15. I'm sorry, small blind and big blind have 10. I'm on the button with 15. Everybody else has 100. So we're clearly like not very, not, not a good shape. If they happen to fold to us, which should never happen, but if they happen to fold to us on the button, we should probably go all in with any two cards. Or very close to it. Because all the 10 big blind stacks have to do to get in the money is just fold for like five hands and they're going to get in the money because one of the one big blind stacks is going to go broke, right? So that's a good example of where we're on the stone bubble. There's big ICM concerns. We are one of the shortest stacks in the tournament, yet we should be playing 100% of hands all in, okay? So the idea of always play tighter on the bubble is not right. Sometimes you play tighter on the bubble. Good example. 15 big blind stack goes all in with 100% of hands. I don't even know what the right calling range is for the small blind and the big blind, but it's going to be really tight. Like, 
the queen's probably supposed to fold. So that, there you have them being hyper tight, right? Because they're guaranteed to get into the money if they fold for three hands. And they're not going to win the tournament anyway, most likely, because everybody else has 100 and they have 20 if they double up. Okay, what are we looking at here? Hijack opening range. Okay, let's go over here and look at button opening range. As you see here, button open raising range. Pretty wide, pretty wide. All the team at Full House listens to the Twitch stream. Well, hope you enjoy it. We do this on Mondays, bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Take a look at the button raising range. Are you raising this wide on the button when they fold to you? 55% of hands. 80 big blinds deep. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. If you're not, figure out why. Again, if anything, I think you should raise a little bit wider than this. Because why? Small blind and big blind don't three bet enough. Let's take a look at small blind strategy versus raise from button. Again, all these charts are available in the poker coaching app for premium members. Is a small blind three betting you with eight six suited, six five suited, jack eight suited, king five suited, queen ten offsuit, ten nine offsuit, ace five offsuit, eight ace ten offsuit, king ten offsuit? Are they three betting you with all of these hands? Most people don't, at least in my experience, especially in small six games. Okay, fine. Is a big blind I'm going to three bet all these hands in red, and 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 call all these hands in green? This is the wrong thing. One second, one second, one second, one second. Big blind versus raise from button. Always make sure you're looking at the right chart. All they're going to three bet all these hands in red. I already told you they're not. Are they going to three bet all these hands? I already told you they're not. Are they going to call all these hands? I already told you they're not. So if anything, you can open wider. Right? So button raising range should actually be wider than this if you're adjusting to take advantage of what most people in most games do wrong. Again, maybe your opponents are maniacs. You should play a little bit tighter. If you know you're going to get three bet every time, fold out a bunch of these weaker hands, right? Fold out fold out a lot of the hands on the cusp. It's really not hard to adjust to what your opponents do wrong whenever you know where you're starting from. And fortunately, it's all right here on your phone in the Poker Coaching app. You can download the app. The app's completely free to get. You will not have full access to everything if you're not a Poker Coaching member, but you have access to some of the stuff. All right. Let's take a look now what happens as we get shallower stacked. What if we have 60 big blinds? As you see here, we have all different stack depths for tournaments because you're going to be in all sorts of spots. What happens if you have 60 big blinds on the button in a tournament? Should you play wider or tighter? What do you think? Well, to be, to be fair, it depends on what your opponents do wrong. But take a look here. Supposed to play 55% of hands, 80 big blinds deep. You're going to see that as we get shallower, we play a little bit tighter. Now it's 54% of hands. What about 40 big blinds deep? A little bit tighter. 51% of hands. What about 30 big blinds deep? A little bit tighter. 45% of hands. What about 25 big blinds deep? Eh, roughly the same. What about 20 big blinds deep? Eh, roughly the same. A little bit tighter. What about 15 big blinds deep? Eh, a little bit tighter, right? So as you see, as you get shallower and shallower and shallower and shallower and shallower, you have to play a little bit tighter. Just a little bit tighter. But you see, we go from playing 55% of hands, 80 big blinds deep, to 40% of hands shallow, uh, when we get really shallow. It's a pretty big difference, right? And if you're not making that adjustment, you're probably screwing up. Again, this is why it's important to know where to adjust from and where to adjust to. Because I got to imagine if you play the same range from the button, the same even loose adjusted range from the button, 80 big blinds deep and 20 big blinds deep, same range, you're going to be screwing up, right? Okay. Um, what else do you want to talk about? Let's talk about when you get when you get three bets. Let's say we raise low jack's seat versus three bet from button. Low jack raises, button three bets us. What do we do? Playing 80 big blinds deep. Okay, we have a bunch of bunch of colors here. We have all in with basically ace king only. Four bet small, not all in. All these hands in red, the nuts and blockers. Call the hands in green, fold the hands in blue. Okay? So notice that our four betting range is very, very, very polarized. One thing I will say right here, 
whenever you look at a chart like this and there's like one hand that's all in or one hand that's doing one particular play, you probably don't, you don't want to do that for simplicity. You probably just want to lump that in with the, the closest comparable range. In this case, it'd be the four bet non-all in range, right? So I, if you, I mean, I realize Ace King jams 48% of the time here, like whatever. By the way, you ever make big all ends? You probably should be making big all ends at some sometimes. I mean, look at the GTO charts and tell you it'll tell you when. But imagine if you raise from the low jack seat button three bets, and you know the button's three betting a ton. If the button's three betting a ton, you should be four betting a lot more often, right? What if you also know they're gonna rip it in on you if you five bet small every time? But they're gonna fold a lot if you four bet all in. Maybe you should be four betting all in a lot, right? Okay, so take a look at this chart. Something a lot of people do wrong is they never, or close to never, four bet these hands in this vicinity. They just don't do it. They fold them every time, or maybe they call. Hey, Thomas, come here. Oh, you peed your pants? Oh, no. You don't want a boy who's peeing his pants to come into your little office. That would be bad. Um, okay. Let's take a look at this. Four bets here. Most people don't four bet, clearly, right? By the way, you may ask, what do we do with ace to queen if we four bet it? Well, we have charts for that. Versus five bet all in from the button. You fold. This is a blocker bluff. You call it off with aces, kings, queens, jacks, and ace king. You may say, ooh, do we really call it off with jacks? Mm, maybe not. Now, I will say, if you expect your opponents to not five bet all in very often, which, uh, let's, let's be fair, they don't five bet all in very often, perhaps we should not have four bet it to begin with. Notice that jacks only four bets 40% of the time. I know you probably can't see, but it does say 40% here. Um, jacks only four bets 40% of the time to begin with, so it's not like it's four betting very often, right? But there you go. Why do the offsuit broadways have more raises than the suiteds? These are bluffs. These hands here are bluffing. These hands here, the suited ones, don't want to bluff because they want to see the flop. Like, why is 7-6 suited played and not 7-6 offsuit? Because it flops well. Why is king queen, uh, queen, king queen suited called and not 4-bet? Because it really wants to see the flop and does not want to get 4-bet off its range. This is a very, very common thing. Whenever you are 4-betting or putting in lots of chips, usually you want to be very polarized. You either want to have the nuts that's getting it in or a bluff, a bluff. And the bluff, when you get it in, is going to be ace-x blockers and king-x blockers. And notice here, all the bluffs, literally every bluff has either an ace or a king because that blocks aces and kings and ace-king, the hands that your opponents are most likely going to get it in with. If a player consistently plays a certain way, though, doesn't that make them face up? The nice thing about the GTO strategy is that you don't really care if your opponent knows what you can do. The cool thing is that you can announce to your opponent, hey, I'm using this chart, take it. And you know what? You're still going to, well, you're gonna break even at least, and you're gonna beat them probably because they're not going to play appropriately. I mean, for example, if you gave me, who studied this stuff a ton, this chart, and asked me which hands should the button for a uh, five bet all in with. I don't know, you tell me, sit here and think about this. This is what I'm doing. I'm telling you. Develop the proper strategy. Figure it out. I can't do it. I'm good at this game. So let's take a look. Button versus four bet from low jack seat. It's probably going to have more bluffs than you think. Oh, never mind. We're all in. My apologies. When you're all in, you're usually all in very linear. Usually minus aces. Notice, though, aces actually does not jam. Ace king doesn't even jam every time. If you're not all in, it'll be more polarized, but we are all in. When you start to get all in, you don't have garbage bluffs anymore. Notice now we have these weird calls. Consider this. I would not have called this wide. If low jack raises, we three bet the button with the 10-9 suited, they four bet us. We're supposed to call the 10-9 suited. Now, I'm sure we're presuming a relatively small size. Uh, 2.3, 6, what? 16, something like that. Probably going to 16. So we have to put in 10 to win like 34, something like that. Guess you got to call the 10-9 suited. That's annoying. <laughs> um, so anyway, as you see here, whenever you're facing the small 4-bet, you have to call a decent amount. 
right? Now, now again, what if your opponent does not 4-bet bluff enough? What if they don't have the ace-3 suited? Well, then you should call tighter, right? Which is why it's important to know where you're adjusting to and from. But as you see here, only in with basically the nuts. And this is why, by the way, you ask why is ace-queen 4-betting and then folding? Well, look what you're folding out against. You're folding out against aces, ace-king, kings, queens, and the jacks that you're flipping against half the time, right? Okay. Um... One more thing I want to discuss today. I know we only have a few minutes. I have to get going. Let's discuss 10 big blind strategy. I'm going to hide it from you. 10 big blind strategy on the button. What should they do when they fold you? 10 big blinds deep on the button. Well, let's find out together. 10 big blinds deep on the button. Raise first in strategy is not all in or fold. It is not all in or fold. If you're playing GTO and you go all in or you fold every time, you're probably screwing up. Now, I will say, exploitatively, you can probably jam wider than this. Exploitatively, you can probably min-raise wider than this, especially with more bluffs. So many people have been deceived by the various push-fold charts out there where they limit the options to going all in or folding. But don't forget, everybody. Don't forget, everyone. We are playing No Limit Texas Hold'em. You can bet any amount you'd like. Okay? I mean, if you can pl play with any strategy you like, why would you limit yourself to all in or fold? It's going to sound bad. But I, I kind of feel like whenever people give all in or fold charts, they are saying, I think these people cannot implement a strategy that is the least bit difficult whatsoever. It's almost insulting. Now, I'm all for having really simplified charts, if that is you. But it's my job to try to teach all of you to be really good at poker. And to be fair, I used to follow push fold charts because back then uh, nobody knew what they were doing. If nobody knows what they're doing, uh, I guess uh, slightly, slightly bad charts is going to be better than not slightly bad charts. But if we look at a push fold chart, you're going to find that instead of getting to play 39% of hands, I don't know what the number is, you probably get to play like 35% of hands. So 4% of hands fewer whenever you shove or fold, which means you're playing roughly 10% fewer hands on average, 4 divided by 35, um, which means you're just missing out on 10% of profitable spots, right? So do you want to miss out on 10% profitable spots? I personally don't. I'd rather play my profitable spots. Uh, let's take a look at 12 big blinds deep. You're going to start seeing now that you get to play even more min raises. A lot of min raises, right? Ask yourself, 12 big blinds deep on the button when they fold to you. Do you ever just, do you ever min raise and then fold? Almost no one, unless they're good, min raises these types of hands and then folds into a shove. They just fold or shove everything. And that's a big, big, big mistake. Big, big, big mistake. Let's take a look at big blind versus raise from button. It's not all interfold either. Here's where people really screw up. There's a company a while back that put out um, all interfold charts against a raise. Take a look at this chart. If you use a shove or fold strategy in the big blind against a raise from the button, look at the difference between an all interfold chart and an all in a call or a fold chart. You get to play substantially wider by calling. Which means all these hands you're calling are profitable. You get to play substantially wider in a profitable manner by using all of your options. Now, to be fair, maybe it could be even more profitable if you added in a minimum re-raise or something. I don't. I mean, if it is going to be profitable, it's going to be minimally profitable. But whenever you limit strategies, you make your strategy naturally some amount unprof more unprofitable. The question is, is it worth trying to collect it, that, that amount of money in exchange for making your strategy more difficult? But in this spot, it definitely is because you see you get to play pretty wide, you know, 60% of hands compared to, I don't even know, 30% of hands if you're all interfold. Does Phil Helmuth use GTO? Phil Helmuth invented GTO. Didn't all of you know that? Let's take a look at um, another spot I wanted to show you. Under the gun, 10 big blinds deep. This is another spot where a lot of people screw up. Again, as you see, 10 big blinds deep, under the gun, still min raising, right? 10 big blinds deep, under the gun, has a decent amount of min raises. Same thing, 12 big blinds deep, right? And as we move up to 15 big blinds deep, you're going to see basically no all-ends. 15 big blinds deep, under the gun, basically no all-ends, okay? That said, on the button, 15 big blinds deep, 
you are going to have some all-ins. Primarily with the Ace X offsuit, junky big offsuit cards, and small pairs plus some suited connectors, right? Pretty common range you definitely want to make sure you are aware of. Let's take a look at small blind 15 big blind steam. Lots of limping. Lots and lots of limping main shoves, Ace X, suited connectors, and small pairs, right? Ah, that's going to be a tip for today. Hope you enjoyed this. You can get some of these charts at pokercoaching.com slash charts. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, all of these charts are available on the website and also in your phone in the Poker Coaching app. If you're a Poker Coaching member, by the way, we have all sorts of stuff in the Poker Coaching app. Can Helmuth beat Negranu? I think Helmuth's already beat Negranu three times because Phil Helmuth invented GTO. That's going to be it for today. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button. Check out pokercoaching.com slash valentines if you are not already a member. Can you show us the chart if jammed on after raising 10 big blinds on the button? Well, it's, the chart was very polarized. I'm going to show you what you should do real quick. Button, raise first in strategy. All the hands at the top of the chart call. All the hands at the bottom of the chart fold. These fold. These call. Okay. Button versus all. Three bet all in. From small blind. Call all the hands that are good, fold all the hands that are bad, and from the big blind, same thing, right? Same range, okay? Whenever you're playing a polarized strategy, you call the hands that are good, you fold the hands that are bad. And you may say that is like ace four and ace two good enough, and the answer is, yeah, it's not great, but pot odds, right? Pot odds exist. Let's take a look at 12 big blinds, uh, button versus three bet all in from small blind. You're gonna see still that all these hands call. Notice the strategy is actually a little bit different. You don't min raise any of these. And um, versus big blind, same thing, same range, right? The nice thing about polarized ranges is all of your calls are very clearly profitable and all your folds are very clearly profitable. Most of the time, you're going to find that polarized strategies do not like min raise hands like the king 10 offsuit because you don't really want to min raise call it, you don't really want to min raise fold it, therefore you end up shoving it. All right, enjoy yourselves. Make the most of this week. Thank you for being here. I enjoy all, I enjoy being here with all of you. I appreciate it being here with all of you. It's a lot of fun for me too. <sighs> Have a good day. I'll talk to you all next time.